right. Philippians chapter number one is where we're going to spend our time for our preaching on this morning. Uh, it is, uh, I revisit this passage from time to time. I preach this passage of scripture the first Sunday I started the way uh, here. You know, this has been a go-to passage for me for many years in my uh, spiritual and ministry journey. And uh, I'm grateful to be able to come back to this passage from time to time and just know that there's something in here that can continuously encourage us and keep us reminded that the work of God in our lives, uh, as was just stated to us, is never ending, that God keeps doing great things for us. So today we're going to try to be reminded of that. I don't plan to be before you long because I love for us to get some good fellowship time. And um, but this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Philippians chapter number one. Uh, this is uh, verse number three. I think it should be on the screen. Uh, and I'm going to read from the new international version uh, for our hearing today. The scripture says this. I thank my God every time. Somebody say every time. Every time I remember you. For in all of my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership. Somebody say, we are partners in the gospel from the first day until now. 18 years. Amen. Being confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And it is right for me to feel this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you, somebody say all of us, share in God's grace with me. So God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Verse number nine, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus to the glory and praise of God. This is the word for the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're going to, amen, talk from uh, this title that says God finishes what God starts. God finishes what God starts. God, we ask you to bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our hearts so we won't sin against you. And as I stand to preach and teach your word, I ask you, God, to allow the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy may it rest on me and all the hearers of your word and We'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, so 18 years ago, I uh, was returning from Duke University in North Carolina. I just finished my Master's of Divinity and was in many respects, you know, a very highly energetic, skinny-looking teenage adult that uh, knew that God had called us to do something that was going to keep the legacy of my home church. This church is the church where my grandmother started a church that was called Gethsemane uh, Gospel Lighthouse Church in 1972 here in Berkeley after moving out here from North Carolina. And we used to have church down the street on 9th and Hearst in an Episcopal church, and we used to, you know, drive over from San Francisco, my father and a whole bunch of us, Sister Daisy and Renee, and we would get in a van, and all our siblings, and we all had lots of siblings, amen. 
I think Sister Daisy and Brother Hill had about many kids as my parents. Amen. We all got in a 15 passenger broke down church van and we would just drive over here and we had folks from HP and folks from East Oakland and folks from Berkeley and we all would just sit up in here. We were all little kids and we all have grown up and and uh, when I came home from school, though, I, I did feel compelled and advised certainly from my pastor and my father and others to take the responsibility of trying to extend the legacy of a ministry that for at least at that time in 2005 uh, had been active for well over 30 years, working to try and ensure that the gospel of Jesus Christ was proclaimed in Berkeley among the people who were looking for God in all the right and wrong places. And as I was at Duke, kind of pulling together my vision for what kind of church I felt called to um, help cultivate, God gave me um, this idea. You know, I was, you know, young and, you know, trying to be hip, and I don't care about that too much anymore because... When you get old, you just want to be alive. Somebody say amen. I mean, I'm young, still young relatively, but you know, back then I was trying to be all relevant. <laughs> trying to connect with the kids and, you know, do stuff. You know, I thought slogans, you know, good slogan. They just going to pour in here. But these words did emerge from my spirit and we talked about that we wanted a church that was live. Y'all remember that? The way is live. L stood for loving. I stood for intellectual. V stood for visionary. And E stood for empowering. Thank God for some of our earliest members who believed and remembered that. That the way is live. We are a church that was built on activating the art of loving folks. And I thought that was important, and I still do today because the church followers of Jesus in the West, in America, unfortunately, uh, are not known for loving folk as much as we are for, you know, at times being against folks. Depending on where they are in the social kind of hierarchy of value and uh, how they may describe themselves or how they may be described by the world. The church has often uh, been described or been party to activities that in many respects foster self-hatred more than self-love. And so, you know, as someone who deeply follows the ways of Jesus as best as I can, I thought that we ought to be a church that would cultivate the art of loving people well. The art of making sure that when I get in the presence of another human being, regardless of what they may believe, regardless of what I may think, when I leave their presence, love is the most important thing they can recall about our encounter. Mm -hmm. Loving. Because how many of you know there's a lot of reasons why you could leave the presence of someone as a hater? Mm -hmm. And how many know some of us have been taught how to be a hater more than a lover? Amen. I think P.J. Morton had a song that says, I'm a lover, I'm a lover, I'm a lover, not a fighter, not a fighter, not a fighter. Amen. But I take fighter out and say, not a hater, not a hater, not a hater. Tell your neighbor, don't be no hater, be a lover. Amen. Amen. And, and so the second thing that I thought would be important is that we would also be a church that is serious about intellectual cultivation. That at times our faith can be considered to be in opposition to science, to business, to cultural kinds of uh, 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 contributions that that we can uh, use our faith as a reason to not pursue the discipline of one's mind. And so that we would be a people who embraced cultivating the gift of your mind. 
that you would go to school, somebody say amen, and you would graduate, somebody say amen. If you dropped out of school, you would go back to school, amen, and you would get some degrees and some professional certificates that you and I would be people who embrace the intellectual inquiry of Christian faith, that we wouldn't just be driven by doctrinal kinds of pursuits, but that we would wrestle with the whole of the theological tradition of our faith and be willing to engage others and not be a person of violence or hegemonic colonial enterprise. To be an intellect is to be someone who appreciates that of all the wisdom and knowledge in the world, you will never know it all. But you can know enough about God where you can say throughout the course of your life, you can't make me doubt God because I've learned and I've known too much about this God. Intellectual. Then we said visionary. We wanted to be a place where we could have the ability to see those things that are not as though they already are. That we would have a vision for our own lives, for our family's lives, that we will cultivate the God-sized dream that God placed inside of us as a seed. How many of you believe there's something inside of you that only God could have put in your spirit? Hello, somebody. That, 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 you know, you could have been sitting down in your chair, clicking your heels, and, and you could never come up with the big kind of dream that God has for you to carry out in the world so God's creation can experience God through that which God has placed in your hands. That some of us are carriers of vision. Let me correct that. All of us are carriers of vision, a vision for your family, a vision for your community, a vision for yourself, and that that vision that God places inside of you is intended to give you a snapshot of the future as a tantalizing tease for you to keep going till you see it come to pass. Uh-huh, visionary. And then we said we wanted to be empowered or empowering, which just meant we didn't want to have all this love and all this intellect and all this vision and keep it to ourselves. We need to be out in our community. And we needed to be an empowering agent in our community. Now, this is such an interesting kind of point because, you know, before, you know, I became this, you know, protesting activist, black liberation theology preacher, I just wanted to get out of the community and help somebody get a job. <laughs> help Pookie stay out in jail. Somebody say amen. <laughs> I, I just want you to graduate from school. <laughs> that's, all, that's all the empowerment I had in my mind. I certainly wasn't trying to overthrow the white supremacist government that is the greatest exporter of violence in the world. <laughs> but, you know, 18 years has caused me to develop. <laughs> Loving, intellectual, visionary and empowering. And over the years, we have tried to live into the best of who we have been called to be. And yet I can say that we are still a work in progress. You are still a work in progress. That God is not through bringing the best of us and you to the surface that how many of you can acknowledge you know where I was five years ago I'm not in that place today mm -hmm. some of you got some promotions better titles praise God <laughs> more responsibility some of y'all was single and now you got a boo and a child somebody say man some of you were struggling to make it home from jail or prison, and now you are pretty solidly moving. Some of you had relationships that were on the rocks. You got out of the bad ones, got into a good one. Some of you were on your deathbed, and you still alive. Hello, somebody. God did some good stuff, and yet, as the old song used to say, I'm not where I used to be but I'm not where I should be. That there is this sense that there's more. And I want to affirm this soft voice or this persistent 
push that's in your spirit, beloved, that there is more for you. Pat yourself on the chest, say, there's more for me. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him there's more for you. And while there is more, how many of you can acknowledge that there are times where the more can often be felt as so far away from you and I that you and I kind of lose a little bit of our faith. Do I got any folk whose faith is, you know, we in church, so you ain't got to lie, Craig, amen. But can, can a few of us say, man, my faith sometimes feels a little thin. Any thin faith in here at times? Not all the time. You just, you just, you know, skating on thin ice. But you've had moments where, as the Bible says, my foot would have slipped. <laughs> Why? Because I beheld the wicked. And I see how the wicked seem to be thriving. While I'm trying to do the right thing, but it seemed like the wicked just be out here winning. Anybody ever watch the wicked win? You'd be sitting there like, what's, God, what, what's up with the wicked winning? And, I, you know, I'm not talking about your boo. I'm not talking about your family. I'm talking about, you know, wicked people like, you know. Y'all know the difference between wicked people and people you don't like, right? Not everybody you don't like is wicked. <laughs> I, I, I use the word wicked very purposefully. When I'm in meetings with certain elected officials and they are oppressing the poor, I call them wicked. Because, see, I, I'm not a cussing preacher for the most part, praise God. And so, you know, I, I be having to find other words that can drive home that I'm really trying to pierce your, your exterior shields with my words. So I don't yell at folks. I say, man, you're so wicked. Y'all shake my head. You're just so wicked. Be like, Pastor Mike. Be like, what? You are. I mean, what do you mean? But you know, you don't got to be wicked your whole life. You don't have to be a wicked mayor, a wicked governor, a wicked president, a wicked police chief, a wicked pro. You know, I just be telling them. And they be like, not, they're not wicked because I don't like them. They're wicked because they seem to be okay watching the vulnerable suffer. And I often get discouraged that, God, why are the wicked prospering while all of us who are struggling to do the right thing seem to have doors closed so often in our faces? And this passage of scripture is a great reminder consistently to me and I hope to you today that even when it appears the wicked is winning, God is always at work in us. Now, this may seem like a cliche to some of us who've been in church for a while, because how many of you have heard your whole life that God is in control, right? And it's like, oh, you know, God is in control. You'd be like, how is God in control? And I'm going through hell. We had a, a, an opportunity to do a question and answer time, and one of the good brothers, young Jesse, I don't know if he's here today, we were talking about heaven or hell, and I was talking about how there is in the whole of the Christian tradition, it is not settled that there is a hell with fire and brimstone, you're going to burn and be punished your whole life, that there are some in the Christian tradition that think that hell is just a, a way of talking about the end of life, that your life just stops. And those who go on in eternity have fellowship with God. And one of the young brothers said, well, uh, I talked to some young brothers here in the community and some of my friends, and they say they feel like hell is now because they've suffered so much loss and so much pain and so much trial and struggle, lost their father, lost their mother, lost their brother, lost their cousin, and hell feels for them to be their life right now. And I began to think about that for the last couple of weeks. What do you say to someone who believes that they are experiencing hell on earth? Well, I want you to be conscious, beloved, that we are not a people who have not had to endure this reality of hell on earth. 
in our history. Whether you are an indigenous person, I can imagine when the colonizers came and pushed all the indigenous folk off their land, they must have thought, man, I'm experiencing hell on earth. When we who were brought here in chains had to endure the 200 years of legalized physical, sexual, psychological brutality. No, Governor DeSantis, slavery was not a good thing for black people. It was not a thing that gave us transferable skills. Hey Amen. To be a slave in this country was to have your mind and your body and your family and your culture brutalized and, and crushed under the boot of those who thought they were God themselves. If there was any transference of skills, it was the demonic sense of power that inhabited too many slave owners and made them forget that they were human, just like all of us. We are not a people who need to walk through life trying to erase the struggle, but I think the writer today is helping us to be reminded, as the scripture says in verse 6, that we can be confident of this very thing, that if God starts something in us, there is no devil in hell. There is no politician. There is no hater. There is no circumstance that can stop God's move in our lives. So one of the first things that I think you and I have to consistently uh, surrender ourselves to if we are going to endure the process of time that is often the companion of God's work in our lives is we have to surrender to holy persuasion. Somebody holler, I need holy persuasion. Now, it's really important to be reminded that in this text, Paul declares, I'm confident of this very thing. And when you study the word confidence, it ain't just this kind of sense of, you know, uh, my mind is made up. And I'm on my way up, going to hold my head up, going on with the Lord. I mean, you know, I, you, you should sing that till you believe that. But the word teaches us that your confidence, your persuasion happens over a period of time based on measurable evidence that God builds our confidence over time by God continuing through the course of our life to remove fear, doubt, and anger that often chips away at your confidence. That while the enemy or your experiences are trying to chip away at your confidence, God is actively working to build your confidence. God is wanting you to be sure that no matter what happens in your life, I got a wrench, I got a hammer, I got some nails, I got a saw, and I'm building something. <laughs> Lord, I feel good today, amen. You ought to tell your neighbor, God's building something. You know, uh, I, I don't know if you've ever tried to build something. You know, I was a Lego guy growing up. And, you know, I, I, I love to play with things with my hands. And, and there were some times when, you know, I had to start something and it was so complicated I had to just let it sit for a while. Go do something else. Because it was frustrating me. I want to knock the whole thing over. <laughs> but I learned that sometimes what I'm building, I can't do it all at one time. That I got to spend a little time with the thing. How many of you know that over the course of your life and your journey, God is building something over the time and discipline you spend working on that thing? God is building something in you. And because life has tried to tear you and I down, you can't get everything that God is building in you all at one sitting. So sometimes you got to go back. You had one therapy session. Oh, how come they didn't solve my problems? <laughs> you got 30 years of stuff. So maybe you need to go back again. 
lay out on that couch, sit up in that chair, and let God and that therapist help you build some things. Oh, I went to school and I dropped out. It was just too hard. How come I don't know everything? Well, maybe because you got to go back to school, sit under some folks who know some things, and spend time letting your confidence get to the place where you will not be so easily knocked off course because you got a little bit of opposition. I was, I don't know how, how many of y'all were at the Kahinde Wiley exhibit and you got to see this great exhibit, 18 pieces, sculpture, paintings, portraits, 18 pieces, one of the pieces is 30 feet high. And I was saying to myself, as much as I love art, what this brother has put together, it's obvious this brother had a lot of time. Not just to put it together, but to have to learn how to put it together. How many of you know sometimes your persuasion by God happens as you learn how to master that which God has placed in your hands. And because many of us don't start with a silver spoon in our mouth, God bless y'all to do, we don't get a head start. Sometimes we got to dig it out the mud. Hello, somebody. Sometimes we got to dig ourselves out the mud. <laughs> it's like I'm digging myself out the mud. So then I go back and dig that thing out the mud. But if you have this sense of confidence that God don't start what God won't finish, then you will stay at it until the question, you can see how God is trying to persuade you through your life's journey that I'm still at work in you. Trials come not to crush you, but to give you an opportunity to find and see God at work in our lives. And I found the more that I can see God at work in my life, the more I can turn those life experiences into tools that can help me make the next leap in this next season of my life. Anybody have some experiences that were meant to destroy you, but now you wear it on your side like a tool? Lord, I wish I could talk to somebody today. You used to be a quick draw. <laughs> Man, had a quick right hook. A real loose tongue. And it didn't take long. Just a little bit of a look, a push, the wrong thing, oh, you got me messed up. You know, that was a show, you know, said if you was using the other word, I'm not gonna use it on Sunday while I'm preaching. But now you have learned how to bring your anger, your offense into a whole different part where, now you laugh at people, <laughs> you're like, man. <laughs> God bless you, man. Anybody, anybody grown to that point? And man, you know, there's some folk that some of you who know 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 what it's like. And man, I wasn't no real fighter. I was around a lot of people who fought, so I didn't have to fight. Man, when they, when things got hot, I'd just take a step back and let them handle my life work. Praise God. <laughs> but I've watched people who literally could not control themselves now are the most disciplined people. I know, and when their discipline kicked in, that's when their ascent to God's best began to emerge. And I want you to know, child of God, that for some of us, God is trying to turn your weakness into your greatest asset. God is trying to turn your greatest pain into your greatest tool and test 
testimony. So when you get to where God wants you to be, you won't squander it because your tongue or your hands or your your whole uh, person is out of control where you lose progress because you did not have discipline. God is trying to persuade you. Second thing that I want you to appreciate today is listen divine discernment produces transformative decision making divine discernment produces transformative decision making I, I can't I can preach a whole sermon it's just by itself but you know if there's anything we need today in a world that is characterized by misinformation by people who claim to follow the same thing. People out here claim to be Christians. People claim to be Americans. People claim to be everything, and yet their beliefs and lives are totally antithetical. How many of you know that just because you call yourself a thing don't necessarily make you my model? (laughs) Amen. Not everybody's counsel is worth your attention. Divine discernment. What is divine discernment? Divine discernment is the ability to cultivate a God-informed consciousness. The ability to cultivate life at all costs through every decision you make. God will never invite you to further your agenda in order to harm someone else's life. Hello, somebody. Divine discernment. We have been conditioned in this world to be so at war with ourselves with one another, that we pick sides and we decide whose lives are more valuable than other people's and make our decisions based off of our safety, our comfort. I never forget Brother Jabari, one of the young men we worked with in our violence prevention work and and Ben, you know, recounting this story, Pastor Ben, that we were talking to him about putting his gun down. He said, well, you know, I can put my gun down, but that may make you feel more safe. But it ain't going to make me feel safe. <laughs> so that ain't that such a revelation. He says, so when are we going to start having a conversation about my safety and not your comfort? Now, you know, we spend a lot of time trying to unpack a lot of that because, you know, Sometimes we engage in behavior that we think makes us more safe, but it actually makes us more at risk. But there was a very important revelation that I and we have had to sit with is that for many of us, we prioritize our comfort at the expense of other people's safety. And what does it mean for us to be able to discern, as the scripture says powerfully, Discern God's will. The scripture says it like this, that your love may abound. Lord, this is, this, 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 this is a real good passage right here. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Jesus Christ. I believe that the more deeper we can engage in love for one another, the more informed our discernment becomes when we make decisions. No, some of us is, you know, Pastor, what are you talking about? I'm talking about that some of us are so out of love with ourselves, so out of love with God, so out of love with our neighbor, that whenever we make a decision, the decision, even though we think is for our good, is actually harming us because we don't even know how to love ourselves well. We don't even know how to love our neighbor well. 
So it's like I'm just going to feed my insatiable appetite to be comfortable when in sometimes learning to love myself means I got to take on some hard things. I got to say no to some things. I got to say yes to some things. I have to say, 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 you know, I'm going to make space for some people because I realize they are in such a, a state of danger that my discomfort will not trump people's safety. And I just want you to know, child of God, that we have a model here as we follow Jesus that we can learn to love ourselves and God and one another so well that when we make decisions, it transforms the conditions that turn danger into safety, that turn sickness into well-being, that turn scarcity into abundance. And this is what it means, child of God, to believe that how I decide my next steps will greatly determine if my circumstances will change. You see, I've learned over the years that I prayed many times for God to change my circumstance. But I've realized that sometimes God wants to change me. Uh huh. Because in my own transformation, I begin to make different kind of choices. Uh, in my own transformation, I begin to make different kinds of decisions. Uh, I vote different when I learn to love myself and my neighbor. I, I, I use my money differently when I learn to love myself and my neighbor. I, 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 I I live in the neighborhood differently when I learn to love myself and my neighbor. I, I make sure that I am not living as a as a, 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 a extorter of people's tools and talents and gifts when I realize that God has given all of us to one another as the greatest and ultimate gift. And this is why I believe that God wants to keep working on some of us because there's something that God is trying to get out out of you that only can be solved by you making better decisions. God says, I place before you life and death today. I place before you good and evil today. I place before you a whole multitude of choices today. What will you do, beloved, to make sure that whatever I decide will bring love and joy and peace and healing and power to myself and to my family and to my community all at the same time? And this is what it means for you you and I then to say God I trust that you will finish it <laughs> even when I make a decision that may appear like I'm taking a loss <laughs> God I believe that when I sacrifice for the good <laughs> you will help me get a flourishing finish <laughs> that's the last thing I'm talking about today <laughs> that your finish can be flourishing <laughs> somebody holler flourish <laughs> finish <laughs> God wants you to know that you don't have have to expect that your end will be worse than your beginning. God says, if you can learn to trust me, if you can learn to depend on me, if you can learn to invest yourself in my ethos, in my way of thinking, in my way of living, in my way of loving, in my way of serving, then you can see a finish that sees you flourishing right Right alongside your neighbor. Uh, do I have a witness that can say uh, that I believe that God uh, wants you and I to flourish. Uh, I believe that God uh, wants you and I to win. Uh, that there does not need to be uh, a winner and a loser uh, in the game of God. Uh, that God gives everybody uh, a participation trophy. God gives everybody a reward for running your race. Your race may be your physical health, but keep on running. Your race may be your relationships. Keep on running. Your race may be your business. Keep on running. Your race may be your mental health. Keep on running. Your race may be your education pursuits. Keep on running. Your race may be at your school, uh, on your job, uh, in your neighborhood, uh, but 
I, I'm confident of this one thing, that the God who started a good work in you and me, he's able to see it all the way through. God won't leave you until God gets through blessing you. God won't abandon you until God delivers you. God won't walk away from you until God turns your situation around, places your feet on a tight, steady rock, and gives you what you need. Somebody shout hallelujah if you believe that God will finish what God has started. God will complete what God has begun. It's only a matter of time before you hit the finish line and you can stand there and say, I am flourishing. We are winning. All of us or none of us. Somebody shout hallelujah. Stand with me, everybody. And if you don't mind, grab someone by the hand or the shoulder or lock arms. And take a moment and just by faith ask God to finish what God has started in your neighbor, in the person you're touching. Ask God to give them a sense of persuasion. The God I know that my neighbor has been on this road for longer than I can imagine. They've had roller coasters. They've had pains. They've had heartbreaks. But God, as they have been on the roller coaster, as I hold their hand, I pray that they will acknowledge that God has been on the roller coaster with them. I know there's some folk in here whose decision making has been a bit questionable. They've been deceived by the liars, the schemers, the fake news, false news, the promulgators of deception. Squeeze their hand gently and remind them that God has been with them, speaking truth to them, teaching them how to discern fact from fiction, life from death, healing from harm. Some of us are trying to figure out how do we make it to the finish line. And we're worried that we're going to stay in this perpetual cycle of pain and trauma. Squeeze their hand gently and remind them that God has a flourishing end for them. Persuade us, God. Give us discernment, God. Help us to finish, God, with the work of your spirit. Remind us that you, God, are able to do anything but fail. So, God, we ask you, bless my loved one who I'm touching. Give them your spirit. Give them your strength. Give them your anointing today. Come on, pray for them and ask God to do a miracle. Ask God to open their eyes to encourage their soul. Ask God to do it in a miraculous and in a powerful way. And we'll say, God, you're able. Come on, say it again. God, you're able. You're able to bless my neighbor. You're able to heal my neighbor. You're able to touch my neighbor. Now lift those hands where you're standing. It's me, O oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. It is not my mother. It is not my father, my sister, or my brother, but it's me, O oh Lord, and I need you, Lord. Somebody say, I need you, God. Come on, say it again. I need you, Lord. I need your strength. I need your power. I need your healing. I need salvation. 
I need victory over the enemies of my soul. I need to conquer the demons of my past. I need to knock down the obstacles to my future. And I believe that you are able to do it. That the more I fall in love with you, God, the more you begin to expose the opportunities. The more I love myself, God, I can see that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and I lack nothing. The more I love my community, God, I am able to see that we are here together to build, to steward creation. So I lift my hands and I invite you, God, have your way. Have your way in me. Someone says, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. From the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of my, to the depths of my soul, to the depths of my soul. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Completely yes. Completely yes. My soul says yes. Can we just say that one more time? Lift those hands, everybody, and surrender to the Lord. Say yes, Lord. Come on, everybody, come on. Yes, Lord. From the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of my heart, to the depths, to the depths of my soul, oh, we say yes, Lord. Completely yes, completely yes. My soul, my soul says yes. I pray today, God, that our yes, God, will be accompanied by your activity in our lives. Bless every person that's saying yes to you today. If you need to be saved today, somebody say yes, Lord. I pray, God, that you will respond to their yes. If you need to be healed today, somebody say, yes, Lord. I pray, God, that you will respond and heal them today. If you need to be encouraged today, somebody say, yes, Lord. I pray today, God, that you will be an encourager of their soul. And whatever it takes, God, remind us that you'll finish what you started. Give two or three people a hug, a high five, and tell them God will finish what God starts. Come on, encourage them today. Tell them God will finish what God starts. Come on, encourage them till they smile at you. Tell them God will finish it. God will finish it. God will finish it. God will finish it. Hallelujah.